Jonathan, thanks so much for joining me today. I appreciate it. Sure. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and it's wonderful to see uh, everyone here uh, watching in person and of course to everybody uh, out in state of the net land watching remotely. Yes. Um, so I thought I'd start off just with a high level, you know, when people think about tech and antitrust, they you know, probably reach for a historical precedent like Microsoft or the AT&T breakup. Um, what makes you know, today's moment the same or different uh, compared to those eras? Sure. So I think there are a number of important points here. First is, um, if you look at some of the most consequential moments in antitrust enforcement, they have come at the dawn of new technological innovations. And so if you think about AT&T, the breakup of AT&T and the historic antitrust case, it predated um, the hardware revolution, uh, including the emergence of companies like IBM. If you think about the IBM uh, investigation and settlement and the antitrust matters, it predated the emergence of the software revolution like Microsoft. If you think about Microsoft, uh, it predated the internet revolution. Uh, and so all of those historic inflection points can be um, tied back uh, to meaningful and significant antitrust cases. Those are the similarities. I think there are some important differences as well, though. Um, when you think about AT&T and Microsoft, for example, you think about cases uh, where um, there was certainly a sub significant amount of, of public interest, uh, but it was largely in the monopolies of those specific companies. If you look at today's moment, it really resembles more closely uh, the early 1900s, the trust busting era, um, when the concerns were not just with one particular company, but the concerns were with monopoly power, broadly speaking. And so in my view, the policy environment today is really more uh, about concerns regarding monopoly power in all corners of our economy. And so how does the, the tech industry fit into that broader fabric in your view? Well, the tech industry is um, the equivalent of the oil industry around the time of Standard Oil. Um, it's, um, it is, in many respects, the lifeblood of our, uh, of our economy. It's, it's the fuel that runs through almost everything we do. Um, people often talk about a tech industry, but every industry is a tech industry. And we confront issues involving technology relating to healthcare and energy, industrials, uh, consumer tech, enterprise tech, um, and everything in between. So a big part of the U.S. Uh, enforcement system obviously involves the courts. And um, I guess, could you talk a little bit about how uh, you know, courts now see these you know, market realities uh, and whether or not they've kept up with them? And if not, you know, where you see the, the biggest kind of task for you is in, in explaining how these you know, market realities have shifted to the Sure. Courts. As the head of the antitrust division, I view my, my role as one of an enforcer, not as a regulator. And so our job is to enforce the law as written by Congress and bring issues before courts uh, and allow courts the opportunity to confront new fact patterns, new ideas, new economic realities. One of the, um, we often internally at the Department of Justice and externally talk about the difference, and this will be something that I think resonates with this particular audience, the difference between poles and wires and ones and zeros. And so the economics of a market involving poles and wires, um, you know, the economics are you know, dramatically different um, than ones and zeros in terms of um, platforms and networks and the cost of building out interconnections. And so it's really important that we evolve um, our understanding of those market realities, the understanding of the economics, the understanding of how competition presents itself in an industry with those dynamics relative to the past. And uh, the only way the law in an area like antitrust can keep up is if we provide opportunities for courts to confront those economic realities, to make sure that competition uh, is being protected in those markets in a way that is relevant to the way the, the how those markets function. How, how would you say the courts have been at recognizing, you know, those differences so far? Um, I'd say that we have an obligation to bring those fact patterns to courts. Uh, and, and overall, I think, you know, if you look 
against the historical backdrop, courts have done um, a good job at keeping pace with antitrust, um, or keeping pace with market developments when they're provided with sufficient opportunities to address them. I think our job is to make sure that we're fitting, um, uh, uh, we're not trying to fit facts into models, but instead using models or frameworks that fit the facts. And so when we've seen our economy transform in ways that are as significant, if not uh, more so than the Industrial Revolution, it's really important that we present those market realities and give courts the ability to update how they apply the antitrust laws in those markets. So your agency has spent a lo lot of effort and, and time um, hiring up technologists, data scientists, AI experts. How are those people working to develop these new models um, you know, for, for this job? And, and what do their days look like? How do you and sure. spend their time? That's a great question. So uh, one of the things that's really important to me is to make sure that um, we have not just uh, legal and, and analytical frameworks that match a modern economy, but to make sure that we have um, the personnel um, and the expertise um, to uh, enforce the law properly. And so um, the kind of expertise that matters today um, is exactly what we have in part, lawyers, economists, um, my favorite, the antitrust division or the paralegals. Um, it's the best paralegal program in the world, I am convinced, um, and our amazing support staff. Um, but one of the gaps that I think we've confronted is um, a, um, the range of expertise beyond those typical categories. And so we have hired, and frankly, we are continuing to hire, and, and we'll be posting some ads for data scientists and analysts. Um, in many respects, what we are trying to build is something that more closely resembles a business school faculty that has the breadth and depth of expertise across many different areas. You asked about data scientists and what do our data scientists and analysts do? Well, it's everything. It's everything from um, helping us ingest data and helping us in, in, in analyze and evaluate that data in a way that is uh, rigorous and sophisticated, um, but they're also helping us understand the importance of data how does data matter in a modern market? And I think one of the things that we're confronting, like I said, in any market that we address today, whether it's healthcare, energy, consumer tech, enterprise tech, and get everything in between, the importance of data is so significant, is so um, substantial that we need to understand at an expert level how that data is used, how it affects the economics, how it affects the potential for tipping uh, moat building and other competitive dynamics. What kind of new technologies uh, does antitrust need to start paying more attention to um, for you know potential competitive harms? Sure. So we often talk at the antitrust division about um, the famous quote from Wayne Gretzky, which is, uh, "We don't just skate to where the puck is; we skate to where the puck is going." And um, and so we're constantly evaluating not just the the technologies that we confront uh, and the innovations and the market realities we confront today, but we're always very actively thinking and learning about um, what's coming down um, uh, the road. And so obviously there are many um, important dimensions relating to AI. These are very real significant technological developments. And one of the things that I, going back to the beginning of our conversation about the importance of AT&T, IBM, and Microsoft antitrust cases, is making sure that we preserve the inflection points, preserve the disruptive capability uh, that flow from new innovations and new key technological developments. At the same time, making sure that dominant, uh, that, that uh, those disruptions lead to healthy and competitive markets uh, and that either incumbent firms are not uh, appropriating those innovations only for themselves unnecessarily or through anti-competitive conduct, uh, but also making sure as those markets develop, we are being thoughtful uh, about the technological realities to ensure that those markets can be competitive. Well, just drilling down on AI for a minute, you know, what kinds of indicators would you be looking at for, you know, potential concerns about whether uh, it's being monopolized or um, used in anti-competitive ways? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's difficult to answer in the abstract um, because it, it's so fact-specific. 
uh, and I think we have a tendency, whether it's something like a phrase as broad as the internet, uh, to, to try to use one term to um, cover everything. Um, and I think, in my view at least, AI is a, an important technological tool in development, the same way you might have a combustion engine uh, it, uh, and, and, or certain types of um, manufacturing technology that was vitally important 100 years ago, uh, but deployed in a very broad and expansive way. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the technologies that we're encountering are just as expansive, at least in terms of potential. Yeah. And so it's really important we understand those, how those technologies work, um, but also how they work in context of a particular market, a market um, uh, uh, a merger or for a set of practices or a set of uh, use cases. Mm -hmm. Or in conjunction with other technologies. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. How about the metaverse? I, you know, that's something that a uh, number of companies have invested you know, huge amounts of money in. They've staked their entire business models on potentially. Um, where do you see that fitting into the broader overall you know, competitive landscape antitrust picture? Yeah, so um, I, that's obviously an issue that's been confronted by my colleagues down the road at the FTC. And so we're watching it uh, with great interest and their work with great interest. I think taking a step back from that particular market, um, it, it's an example of how it's important to stay ahead of the curve and make sure we understand those developments. Um, and, and it's, you know, to be very clear, um, inflection points and changes are good things. Innovations are good things without speaking about any specific technology. Um, from my perspective, or they can be at least, from my perspective, you know, we just want to make sure that those markets are functioning in a healthy, competitive fashion, free from exclusionary conduct or mergers that might um, inhibit the ability of those markets to function competitively. Now, you just brought up uh, the FTC's attempt to block uh, Meta's purchase of within unlimited a virtual reality company and I get that you may not be able to address that specific case but I wonder if you might be able to talk about you know what uh, how the outcome of that um, might shape the way that um, the regulation of, of the metaverse unfolds going forward or maybe some of the legal theories that were advanced in that case yeah so um, you know every case stands on its own and we evaluate every antitrust case whether they come from a government action or from private action uh, with great interest to make sure that we are constantly learning and adapting to where the courts are going. Um, but I read that case, I see a lot of very um, helpful, uh, at least to our mission, um, conclusions regarding the legal framework and the applicability of a legal framework to a dynamic technology industry. Last time you and I talked, you mentioned a little bit about dark patterns and how they might be um, viewed as an antitrust issue. I wonder if you can briefly explain what dark patterns are for this audience and then talk a little bit about uh, more about how you how you see that. Sure. To me, this goes to the importance in context of, of understanding um, market realities, right? And so typically in, or traditionally in um, retail antitrust cases or cases involving um, what we often call smokestack industries, there are assumptions that are made mass about how consumers might respond. So for example, rational consumers might behave in a certain fashion and then you model the behavior of those rational consumers when making determinations. Um, uh, there are also um, assumptions about how um, consumers, for example, will respond in response to certain practices uh, or attempts by firms to extract market power. I think when we look at today's um, world, we see um, technology and behavior that is far more personalized. Um, and so uh, we see the ability to um, set, put forth stimulus or stimuli to be, affect how consumers behave, sometimes knowingly or unknowingly. Um, you know, all of that changes the way in which um, businesses and um, consumers react with one another and um, relate to one another. And I think it's really important that we understand, you know, the good, bad, and sometimes the ugly of how can, um, um, dark patterns or um, personalized targeting can influence how consumers respond uh, when they respond 
um, and the extent to which uh, they are able to benefit from competition or the extent to which a firm that has monopoly power is able to extract um, and exercise that monopoly. How do you connect the, the idea that you know a, a company um, making a decision to nudge a, a consumer to make a certain choice, you know, ac accept uh, giving up their their data or to um, you know agree to certain terms um, in their terms of service? How does how do you connect that to a competitive harm though? Sure. So um, I think it's important that, for example, when we evaluate um, how companies accumulate data, right? A lot of it, um, a lot of the assumptions have been that consumers can discipline, for example, um, bad behavior by switching. But if consumers don't switch as easily as they used to, or consumers are being nudged in one direction or another, that's a market reality that we need to understand. And so the ability to exercise power um, through the acquisition or accumulation of data uh, might present a very different analysis today than perhaps it did 30 years ago. So in that, in that situation, you'd be looking at potentially, you know, persuading a court that actually what we assumed was a, a healthy functioning relationship between the consumer and the company has actually broken down. Potentially. I think these are issues we need to understand in order to be effective. And um, so in, in every instance, when we're conducting an antitrust analysis, we start with the really foundational question of how does this market function? What are the competitive realities? Um, and then we work backwards from that, yeah. as opposed to trying to fit, again, facts into models, which can often lead to conclusions um, that um, are out of touch with market realities. Uh, just a minute left here. Um, the Biden administration's made a big push to promote competition across the U.S. government. Um, I understand your agency has done a lot to work with other agencies yeah. on this front. Can you talk a little bit about um, where the U.S. government is doing well, uh, what agencies are, are you know, strong on this front, and, and what agencies need some help or need some work? Yeah, so I'll resist the temptation to give her a poor card other than to say that I've been um, really inspired by the whole government approach set forth by the executive order. Um, and um, let me get a little bit of feedback here. Is that better? Okay. Uh, and that um, the that uh, we've worked with um, agencies across the U.S. government, including U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, Department of Labor, and LRB, um, and numerous others, uh, Health and Human Services, uh, Inspectors General, Inspector General's Office, uh, in order to um, deploy a whole of government approach. And what we found in our work is that there are competition policies and statutes and rules uh, that exist across the entire government to promote competition and the executive order provides a very healthy framework mm -hmm. for us to evaluate that. Uh, last question for you. Yeah. Um, the department and the FTC have been working on updated merger guidelines to shape how uh, businesses you know, make decisions about how to uh, engage in mergers and acquisitions. Uh, last time we talked, you said that was still a few months out and this was in December. Can you give us an update on um, where we stand there. Yeah, we're working actively um, to um, finalize an next draft of the guidelines, and we hope to have them for broader consumption as soon as possible, um, but we're hard at work. Okay. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining me. Brian, thank you very much, and thank you very much for having me.